Uh, all right, who's ready for another panel? I heard a lot of demand out there for more panels. Guess what, we have one. All right, let's get these folks onto the stage. Entertainment Discovery, we have a really nice variety of people here with some interesting things to say. So uh, please welcome Chris Taylor, Deputy Editor at Mashable, Tamara Mendelson, uh, who does marketing at Eventbrite, Chris Thun, VP of Product for Fanhattan, Otis Chandler, Co-Founder and CEO of Goodreads, Prerna Gupta, Chief Product Officer at Smule, and Mo al Adam, Co-Founder and CEO of Telly. No? There we go. Thank you, Casey. All right, are we ready for some entertainment? Yes, I can feel the excitement. Woo! All right, entertainment panel. So we, we have a lot of folks here in, in very diverse areas, um, but we're, we're seeing some trends. We're gonna try and pick up more trends. Um, and I wanna start with, uh, with you and, and talk about the, you, you, you guys had a survey recently. Um, you want to tell us about that, about social discovery versus old-fashioned search-based discovery? Sure. Um, it's working. Yeah. What's wrong? <laughs> um, so we actually ran a survey um, with an, in, um, in cooperation with Harris, and we surveyed about 2,000 uh, American adults and uh, um, on kind of their behavior uh, when it comes to discovering and watching online video on their mobile devices. And uh, the most sur uh, surprising finding to us was the fact that 68% um, of those people that watch video on their phones uh, discover that video through friends, uh, which means um, you know, on, on their social networks, over email, over SMS. Uh, in comparison uh, to for only 41% who find um, online video uh, through search. Um, so that was, that was really kind of, you know, um, we kind of anticipated that because of you know the way our product is being used, um, which is telly. But um, you know we um, um, it was cool to see it kind of validated by, by that survey. So we go for we go for recommendations. We go for entertainment through recommendations increasingly in our society, which is sort of a good segue to to Goodreads and uh, your guys' experience with uh, a certain book that we should probably get out of the way at the beginning of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good morning. I'm, I'm Otis, founder and CEO of Goodreads, and uh, we're, we're lucky to have a mission which is uh, slightly more noble in the world, which is to help people find and discover good books to read. And um, you know, th this is working incredibly well. We're, we're driving 11 million people a month to say this is a book I want to read. Um, but I think what, what Chris was was driving at was we're increasingly seeing that these community sites, which are, are you know, we, we kind of focus on friends and community, and then we have algorithmic uh, discovery engines on top of that, are really good at, at, you know, building up kind of influencers who are then good at, you know, kind of organically discovering new books. And uh, in 2011, Goodreads was the, the, the place where a book called Fifty Shades of Grey was discovered. Um, this is a book that uh, is not, <laughs> it's, got, it's got some interesting content material. <laughs> Um, and Originally Twilight fan fiction, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was. It was, it was self-published. Um, uh, so th this book is, uh, you know, you know we, we set out to build a, a literary community, not thinking that it would uh, attract people who read erotica and porn. <laughs> um, but these people aggregated, because it was a place for them to aggregate in a safe place. And, uh, and that's kind of how Fifty Shades of Grey got organically discovered. And actually, if you look on the back of book one of, uh, of the trilogy, it says a Goodreads uh, finalist for best romance, because it was kind of just, you know, when the book was unknown by everybody else, it was uh, discovered on Goodreads. I mean, are you, are you finding a lot of that, not just with Fifty Shades of Grey and that whole phenomenon, but with other books that, you know, the readers are telling you what, what they want, rather than, you know, it used to be that the publishers would come out with a few big books a year and they'd run a big marketing campaign around it. Um, is, is that all gone now? Is that dead? Is social the future of books? It's not dead, but it's changing. Mm -hmm. So a publishing executive told me five years ago that the way to make a bestseller is to put it on the front table of every bookstore in the nation. And that's still true today. But it's becoming less true every single day. And what we're finding on Goodreads is we can actually, I would say, amplify the discovery of a book. Mm -hmm. And this has kind of become our business. We work with Random House and all the big publishers to help them amplify their launches. And we do that through 
you know, are this community of influencers and just enthusiastic readers, and we find ways to put the books into their hands, generate the buzz, get the reviews rolling, um, and then, you know, it just kind of takes off from there. But we generally find that between, you know, all these tools we have around the launch, you can actually see it in the charts. Like, you know, the, the friend graph will add this mm. much, and if we do a giveaway, it adds this much, et cetera, et cetera. So amplification is a really good word for, for what social is doing to, I think, all of these spaces. Uh, and it's also a good segue into Smool. And uh, Perona, you, you want to tell us about how Smool uses social? I know that you guys are using it more and more between your apps, but do you want to talk a little about what, what yeah. those apps are? Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Perona Gupta, Chief Product Officer at Smool. Um, we are the leading developer of music creation apps. So we've developed apps that you may have heard of, Ocarina, Magic Piano, IMT Pain, Songify, we have several apps. Um, and our, our mission is to connect the world through music creation. Um, we believe that you know, uh, entertainment and music is a fundamentally social and participatory experience. Um, if you think about it, in, in the past five, 10 years, uh, technology and social media has started to, in kind of a strange way, make entertainment much more isolated and solitary experience. And you read a lot and you hear a lot about people talking about how this is not, I think, from many of our perspectives, ideal, right? We, we, we like to socialize, we like to uh, be entertained together. And so our mission is to bring people together through music creation specifically. And many of our apps are starting to become more social. So we just recently launched an app called Guitar. It's an app where you can strum along um, to you know, many popular songs, many top 40 songs, but what you're strumming to is actually singers, uh, amateur singers from all over the world who sung songs in our karaoke app. And so we've enabled with this the ability for people, strangers all over the world to, to meet each other through our apps and um, to have a very social experience creating music together. And it's interesting, you know, you talk about um, amplification and social discovery of self-published authors, and in many ways we're doing the same thing through our apps in music. So there are incredibly talented musicians that are being discovered in our apps who are starting to you know, create their own music, um, launch albums on iTunes, and it, it's, it shows the incredible talent that exists all over the world and people who might not have the opportunity to go through the traditional channels. All right, thank you, Prana. And uh, Chris, from, from very active entertainment to, uh, I guess, a rather more passive Yeah, so we, I'm from VP of product at Manhattan, and if Goodreads is about discovering a good book to, to read, we're about discovering a good movie and show to watch. And as, as we looked at the, the landscape of, of products that came before us and, and how they attacked the market, a lot of them started with just a search box. And going back to what you were saying from a tele perspective, we didn't think that was really very inspirational in terms of answering that basic question of what I want to watch. And so as we thought through it, we, we put out there a combination of social features, um, discovering movies and shows that your friends have liked on Facebook, um, discovering what the, what the experts are recommending and what's popping right now from an algorithmic perspective. And by far, the, the, the features that people engage with were the features that were about inspiring. It's not about search, it's about ins inspiring people what to watch. And do and you want to briefly mention the, the new product and when, when we're going to see that? Yeah, so the, the, we just announced a new product two weeks ago called Fan TV. Ultimately, our vision is to be cross screen. We want to be available to help you discover what you want to watch, whatever screen you want to watch it on. And so we started with iOS. Um, we evolved to the web, and two weeks ago launched a living room product, um, which is called Fan TV. And we're attacking the different screens differently because the way that you interact with the product is different, whether you're in the living room or whether you're on the web. The, the living room is much more a lean back experience, and so we need to figure out how to enable you to slice all the world's movies and shows very efficiently in a lean back atmosphere. And we, we invented a remote that is essentially based on swipe, but has zero buttons. And so in, in a dark room, you don't have to turn on the lights and kind of get out your magnifying glass to figure out how to, how to navigate. It's really, really simple. 
Um, and so that, that's kind of fundamentally how we think about the world. I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing with that, by the way. It's a, a remote that looks like a mouse. It's just, it has a very Apple feel to it. Uh, and last but not least, we have Eventbrite in the house. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm Tamara Mendelson, and I'm our uh, VP of Marketing at Eventbrite. Um, and you know, our story is very similar to, to my fellow panelists in that when we originally set out to build Eventbrite, it was about building a tool for event organizers to sell tickets online to their events. It was sort of a very simple mission. Um, but what we really discovered was one of the main pain points for our people that organize events is promotion. And um, in the ticketing business, we call it distribution, but it's this idea that you know, if you have an event, how do you get it in front of the people that want to attend? Um, and then on the other side of the coin, as, an, as a consumer, as an attendee of events, there are so many things happening happening out there. Um, how do you discover and how do you find the things that you want to do when you might not know exactly what that is? Um, and these, these things really converged with um, social media. And when we first built Eventbrite, we were really laser focused on optimizing for Google search results for SEO so that people's events would show up in search results. So if I typed in you know, developer meetups in San Francisco, that the, de the developer meetups that were on Eventbrite would show up first. Um, but then what we saw, um, probably in about early 2008, mid 2008 all of a sudden in you know we were tiny we we're probably eight people at the time using Google Analytics and all of a sudden Facebook popped up as a drive a top 10 driver of traffic in our analytics dashboard and when we looked into what was happening we actually saw there were a couple of things um, our more savvy event organizers were taking their Eventbrite events and republishing them into Facebook events so that they could invite groups and circles and pages of people that shared a common interest with the event um, and they'd include a link saying you know register for the event here or buy tickets here, and you know, people were clicking on that and coming back to Eventbrite, and that was traffic that was building. Um, and then on the attendee side, people were discovering events on Eventbrite, and then sharing those on Facebook, saying, who wants to come to this with me? I'm thinking about getting tickets to this on Friday night. You know, and what we found was, as we started to measure that, for every event that was shared in that way, about 14 or 15 people of that person's friends would click on that link and come back to Eventbrite. And so, it was really social media very early on in our, in our sort of genesis that um, was the light bulb moment, the kind of realization that social was really going to disrupt this industry, that it was the difference um, between you know, some of the legacy um, ticketing providers that were out there that people felt they had to use in order to get eyeballs because you know, a ticket master, you could get 20 million people to see your event through their email blast, whereas all of a sudden with social, it was completely disrupted. You could get your event in front of a much more relevant relevant, meaningful audience at zero cost. And that was really sort of the, the beginning of, um, you know, of, of us seeing our business take off. And, and this is still, this is still opt-in, right? It's not, Eventbrite is not automatically pushing it, you know, if I buy tickets to a Justin Bieber concert, <laughs> No one example, will know if you don't want them to know. <laughs> it won't get, I have to click a button, you know, there's no accidental publishing of this no, information. I, 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 mean, I have to stress that's, that's just an example. It's not actually. Just yeah, hypothetically. Yeah. Hyper, purely hypothetical. Um, but this, this does bring up an interesting point, uh, which I want to throw open to all of you guys, which is, you know, we are, the NSA is very much on all of our minds right now. And as much as we're in the social era, we're in the era where privacy, it seems, meet, means less and less. How do you, how do you guys guard against, uh, you know, how do you, how do you navigate that fine line between, you know, the users want to share, but they don't want to overshare. And that line is sort of different for everyone. So how, how, do, you, how do you cope with that? So we, we think about that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, for us, passive curation is, is actually really important. So um, there's this, um, on, on telly, when you're using the product, um, anytime you watch a video, people that follow you can learn that you've watched that video. So initially, we were kind of sensitive about that. Will people like that? Will they kind of react against it? Um, so what we've done is we actually, you know, we started kind of, we tested kind of pushing it out to Facebook with Open Graph, uh, but we stopped doing that. Because we felt that people you know, on, on Facebook, uh, um, you know, they, they didn't really like to see kind of everything they did elsewhere like show up on the Facebook feed. But if we kept that in its own space, on telly, people kind of felt more comfortable that way. And um, you know, without passive curation, it's kind of difficult for us to power like, a really rich feed that is always kind of fresh and, uh, and, um, and interesting. Um, you know, we just have to do a title, tighter uh, content controls for us. People don't, if, if they're kind of passively sharing stuff that they don't mind sharing, then they're okay with it. It's funny, I mean, there, there are some entertainment activities that people are more 
excited about sharing, right? I mean, I imagine Goodreads, you know, people, you know, I, I think we've seen this with, with Game of Thrones recently, like the, the people who knew about the, the big spoiler event were lording it over the people who were just watching the, uh, the TV version. Because we read the book. <laughs> yeah. I, I, did, I did see one tweet. I saw one tweet where, you know, someone was giving out a medal that just said, I read a book. And I was like, you know, congratulations. You, um, you, do, you, do you find that people want to share more about what they're reading other than, you know, compared to other forms of entertainment? Absolutely. Um, the Facebook Open Graph has been a huge driver of our, or accelerant of, of our success. And I think you saw a lot of rising stars, you know, in the video space. We won't name any names. <clears throat> Vidi. Um, <laughs> you know, that we're what's called passively sharing, where the instant you watch a video or consume something, it's being shared without your explicit knowledge. And Facebook is definitely shifting away from that towards explicit, which is you've, you know you're sharing it. And that's definitely a better pattern. But we find that we're able to be successful because books are these incredibly social objects that people just really want to be around, interact around, and share, because they define you, right? The books that are on your bookshelf at home define you. The books on your bookshelves on Goodreads, and now as we push those, or let users share those onto Facebook, that defines you. And I think that's what Facebook wants the profiles to be, is something that if you look at a person, you get a sense of who they are, and the books that they read are part of that. So you've got this natural inclination where it's something that users want to share, and everybody misses that in virality. You, you know, not everybody wants to share a flying sheep, but when you find something they want to share, you can actually get them to do it. Yeah, I mean, it seems people in general want to share things that make them look smart or interesting or original or they have new skills. By the way, speaking of books, I just wanted to bring this up. We've seen recently that uh, 1984 has increased its sales by something like 7,000% in the last week or so. Are you seeing any sort of corollary of that on, on Goodreads? Are you seeing more people are interested in dystopias now? They're reading Brave New World They're, and anything like that? I haven't checked up? in the last day. I suppose <laughs> I should have done that. <laughs> um, but dystopian not, fiction is, is on, as a whole, really mm. on the rise lately. People, yeah. people must be afraid of something. In terms of number of titles, certainly. Um, Smooth is Smooth's an interesting case because you guys, I mean, people may want to be seen as creative, but they're not necessarily actually that creative when it comes to music. So. <laughs> well, yeah, part of our mission is to, to change that to, you know, to help everyone uh, feel comfortable making music. And so we develop tools and technologies that help you sound better, um, regardless of how talented you are. But we really look at sharing in three different phases. So music is a very, uh, people often feel very vulnerable when they're creating music. And so we want to make sure that we give people enough chances to, you know, practice a particular song. And so when you're singing or, you know, playing the piano, um, you can play it as many times as you want. You don't have to keep a recording if you don't like it, right? And so people do. They'll sing something several times before they decide to save it. Once they save it, though, it goes up on our network. And I think in, a, in something similar to Telly, once it's on our network, internally, it is, it's shared, right? And so anyone on this Smule network will be able to, to hear it and comment on it um, and interact with it. Um, and, but then there's a third level for people who do want to share it more broadly to Facebook and, and Twitter and all of that. And that's very explicit. You know, that doesn't happen in, unless a person explicitly um, decides to do that. Right. For the most part, you're, you're anonymous, right? You, you know, just you're sharing the music, man. And exactly. It's, yeah. Exactly. And in many, in many respects, our network is one that connects strangers. So, you know, people sing together, uh, you know, you know, we have people who will be sitting in Holland, you know, a, a guy sitting in Holland who sings a duet with a girl in Indonesia. They've never met. They're complete strangers. They might have anonymous names. And, and that's a good thing, right? They want to just connect through the music. It doesn't, it's not necessarily about people that, that they know in their real lives. And to us, that's the power of music, that it, it forms connections, um, uh, you know, very naturally uh, through a very sort of international, basic human way of connecting. It, it really does sound like some sort of hippie dream from, from the <laughs> late 60s. It's, it's marvelous. I love it. Um, I wanted to switch gears. I, I wanted to, uh, sorry, you had a, you had a Oh, I was just going to say, we see the, the same thing. You know, we really started Goodreads to be about confining books through friends, and I thought that that was going to be the best way. And then suddenly all these people were friending each other that didn't really know each other. And I was like, no, we want to be a real world graph. Um, and then I realized that was actually better. And now we have book clubs formed of tens of thousands of people that started by a woman in Pennsylvania who lives up in the hills that read books together every month. And none of them know each other, 
but they're all connecting around this interesting subject matter that they all care about and have in common. And that's, you know, that's, that's special. That's the power of the internet. So online book clubs really can work, even if you're not sort of meeting face to face. Minus the wine and cheese, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, everyone, as long as everyone buys the same kind of cheese, they're all good. Um, so, so switching gears and talking to, about Van Hatton and Van TV, I mean, I'm kind of curious. I, I remember when Van Hatton came out, I think you guys launched it uh, at D, uh, D10. I believe it was D9. 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 Um, you were, it, it was very much, it, it seemed like the one app to rule them all, right? You had the streaming from Hulu, and uh, you, you guys also have Amazon, uh, Netflix. And Netflix. Amazon. Um, do you, are you seeing any movement in that direction that suggests that you will become the layer? above every other TV service? You know, it's interesting. We, we made the, the conscious decision early on to really focus on building strong relationships with these partners and, and getting official access to the APIs and not hacking our way in. And, and it takes more time. And when we originally launched at D9, I think we had an original slate of four partners. And over the next 18 months, we built partner by partner. And to, to this day, we have, I think, 29 or 30 partners on iOS. So it takes time, but the relationships are much stronger. Um, and so you're going to see us do the same thing on a platform by platform basis. And what's in it for those guys? I mean, if, if you're the layer on top of them, why do they, why do they want to buy into that? So if you think about the challenges that, that partners face, they want new customers. They want to expose their product um, to people that wouldn't normally think about them. Um, and, and so the opportunity of a product like Manhattan is you discover the movie or show that you want to watch, you arrive at a Watch Now panel that has all the different places that you can watch, and it exposes you over and over again in a very natural way of finding a movie that you want to watch to three or four different brands that have that movie. And so in terms of acquiring new users, it's a really powerful model. Uh, so that's what's in it for them. Mm. And you also have apps on TV. You were in the TV app space as well, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the TV, as we thought about TV, um, it was an evolution. Originally, we were looking at the over-the-top players like Netflix and Hulu, and we decided in the living room, that's only a small fraction of the time you spend with entertainment. In the living room, it's much more complex. It's about PS3, it's about Xbox, it's about your cable box. And so we really want, wanted to solve that bigger problem and that's what fan TV is. I mean, it's one box that has live TV, cloud DVR, and then all your over-the-top players. Um, so it's, it's aiming to solve the four hours a day problem as opposed to the four times a month problem that an OTT player. So am I going to have to sign up for cable TV service to use fan TV? We'll see. We're, we're, we're working with the pay TV industry and in, in forming partnerships to, to aim to have as wide as possible, um, national distribution. All right, I'll, I'll just speak on behalf of the cord cutters that we would really, really like if we didn't have to sign up for cable. Yeah, cord cutters in the house. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. Uh, now, Eventbrite is sort of, you guys are sort of the only people on the stage who have claimed to you know, be taking social into the, the real world sphere, you know, book clubs and you know, music uh, jam sessions. Uh, besides, I mean, do you, do you think that there, you think that maybe you could be pushing that a little bit more in terms of, um, you know, we, it does seem like social media has got us sort of, you know, stuck in our living rooms looking at our smartphones a lot. Um, are, yeah. you, are you pitching yourselves that way? Yeah, I think, you know, if you think about events, they are kind of the original social category. Um, if you think about the, the last couple of events that you've gone to and how you've discovered them, it's probably through word of mouth, at least that's what we find when we sort of generally or broadly survey folks, that, um, you know, we are very highly influenced by what our friends and what our colleagues are doing. And so, you know, our the mission is really to take online technology to bring people together offline and have those amazing experiences like when you're sitting in a room and learning from others or giving back to your community or hearing a new band for the first time or learning a new skill or whatever the myriad of events there are that, that are out there um, and, and using that technology to make that experience better, better by bringing more people together, right? More people that are relevant to that subject, um, but also better through things um, like in enhancing the richness of the event, making 
making sure that you're connecting with the right people that are there. Um, and there's sort of a lot of ways that this moves into the future if you think about how technology can be used to actually make that in-person experience better. Um, so yeah, along all of all of those dimensions, you know, we're thinking about how social impacts and influences um, where we go. And I think, you know, one of the stats that I recently saw was we have a mobile app and, and in the app you can kind of see all the events that are happening around you. And we recently added the ability to see where, which events your friends are going to. So in that directory, you'll all of a sudden see like a little face of your, you know, your friend pop up and you see that they're going to the event. And those events are seeing, you know, two to three X conversion rates of events that don't have friends going to them. And it just, I think it reinforces that power of um, social influence and recommendations by by your um, social network. Right. Who, who wants to stand in an arena alone? Uh, I think we've got about four or five minutes left for you know uh, Twitter questions. I don't know if we have any more coming, but in the meantime, there's, there's something I wanted to bring up with all you guys, which is I, I seem to have less and less time in my life, and more and more of it is being taken up by entertainment. And it's not just the entertainment, it's the layers on top of the entertainment. It's not just reading the book, I have to talk about the book now. Uh, you know, I don't just watch Game of Thrones, I obsessively read all the uh, coverage online for several hours afterwards. I mean, is, is that the new normal? Are we, are we just, you know, have we just added this meta layer of commenting on all the entertainment that we discover? Uh, or, or do you think we can, we can get back to a sort of simpler time of just experiencing this stuff? Well, I hope that we can get back to that. I think um, we are probably one of the few entertainment companies that is trying to create that, uh, that idea that, you know, entertainment maybe is about stepping away from all the noise and having um, a true experience that's really just about having fun and experiencing pleasure and bonding with other people in the moment. That's what our apps are about. And you really can't sing a song while checking your Twitter feed and doing mm. 10 million other things. You have to focus on the song. And that's what drives people to our apps. Right, the non-second screen app. I, I believe in this word or this phrase called shared experiences. People love going through shared experiences together. And the fact that we've both read or watched Game of Thrones means we can go geek out on it and we've, you know, we've kind of shared that experience and, and, and have it in common, and it's a basis for us to have you know, a conversation or a relationship. And I think that's, that's the power that, that you know, in, the internet can bring and these communities can bring, is connecting with you with these people to have these shared experiences. And I think that's, you know, I always believe that reading should be done alone and discussing it should happen socially. And that's, you know, we don't have to merge the two, right? They're two different things, but yet we can make them both better. So I'll just have to get used to only sleeping six hours a night while I check all the comments on last night's episode. Um, Fanhattan has, uh, you, you guys have con a layer of content, which is sort of slightly separate from the site. Um, do you, how, how necessary do you think that is? You know, from a editorial perspective, we. We believe, like I said, there are a lot of different ways to discover the entertainment you love. There's, there's algorithmic, there's experts in terms of seeking out critics of movies and TV shows that you trust, and then there's algorithmic. And so a core part of our strategy is to have an editorial team. Um, and we've been experimenting a lot with, with that team in terms of how to get social and, and viral growth. And, and one of the things that we've found is when we attach ourselves to specific fan bases, whether it be The Simpsons, whether it be Game of Thrones, and we discover news around those, those fan bases, it's amazing how, how the, the pops that we get from a traffic perspective. And so from our perspective, the reason that we're doing that is to figure out how to access the various fan bases on the internet and really take advantage of the affinities that, that people have to the entertainment they love. Have you been surprised by the size of a certain fan base? Like, you can guess which fan bases are the most viable. <laughs> Game of Thrones is yeah. the one. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing the same as everything else. Game of Thrones, yeah, Doctor exactly. Who, Star Wars, etc., etc. But, I mean, there are these surprise. I mean, you know, the, the Veronica Mars Kickstarter was a great example of a surprising fan base that just came out of nowhere, right? Um, so, hopefully, we'll have more of those surprises going forward. Uh, I think we just have one minute left, so uh, uh, you guys want to uh, you have any more thoughts? It's been a very congenial panel. I haven't seen a lot of disagreement here. Uh, do you guys want to take issue with uh, anything anyone else has said? 
Come on. <laughs> no, no, we're all we're all uh, happy together in the world of entertainment. I mean, that you guys don't feel like there's any, you know, it's kind of like radio when TV came along. You know, when radio still existed and it, it just wasn't as powerful as before. Uh, I'll just you certainly feel that books can thrive to an even greater extent. You know, with the internet, right? It's not uh, it's not just dead trees. Actually, interesting question. Are most of your readers reading ebooks or uh, paper books, or you, you don't ask that question? We don't discriminate. Mm. <laughs> Whatever you want to read. I mean, clearly, you know, the industry shows ebooks are reaching like 30% of books being read. Um, but Goodreads is, you know, and especially since we were recently acquired by Amazon, which makes the Kindle, uh, it's very important to us to reiterate that we're going to be a platform for people who read all books, uh, whether it's physical, digital. Scrolls, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, you're, not, you're not saying a rise. Ev everybody has the same problem. You know, they come out of that Game of Thrones and they're like, "Man, how can I get another experience like that? That was amazing," and they they want to find one. And Goodreads is a good place to do that. I, I would say, you know, there's my my belief is the biggest challenge facing discovery is to nail serendipitous discovery. Mm. And I think Facebook and Twitter have nailed that to, you know, as to better than anybody else for kind of traditional media and what your friends are doing. Um, but in every niche, somebody needs to nail like just the best way for you to walk in. You know, I love walking in a bookstore. I can walk out an, an hour later and just have an armful of books because it's laid out for me to just catch a book and, and find it and serendipitously discover it. And I think that's what we need to, to re replicate online. All right. Well, you have to tell me where you find the time to read all this. Um, well, that's, that's all the time we have, so I wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to Eventbrite, Van Hatton, Smool, Goodreads, and Telly. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>